This recording is going to address some principles of muscle mechanics. Um, a couple terms that I want you to be aware of before we talk about um, muscle mechanics is two basic principles. The term tension, muscle tension. That's a force developed when a contracting muscle acts on an object, so it creates tension. When the actin and myosin are interacting with each other, that actually produces muscle tension. Now the force exerted on the muscle by the object, for example, the weight of an object, that's the load. Now in some instances, if we want to actually say move a weight, the tension developed within that muscle must exceed the load. However, not every muscle contraction produces movement. So if you're just say holding something and say I've got a weight in my hand and I'm just holding say my, 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 my elbow at 90 degrees and I'm holding a weight, that is we're producing just enough force to maintain that load. Um, so we'll talk about another recording, we'll talk about different types of muscle contractions and muscle contractions referred to as isometric contractions do not produce movement. We'll talk about things called iso isotonic contractions. Yes, they do produce movement. Um, the tension developed um, within a muscle can be determined by a few things. First thing is what we'll address is the amount of tension within one muscle fiber. So remember a muscle fiber is a muscle cell. So what we want to do is we want to get the maximum amount of tension that we can get out of one cell. One of the things that we'll address is the number of cross bridges that are formed. So a cross bridge formation refers to when the myosin heads can interact with actin. And we'll talk about this thing called link tension relationships. The other way that we can get the most amount of tension from a muscle cell is having brain having to do with the nervous system is the frequency in which we stimulate that muscle. Now we'll try, we're will try. we gonna try to get the most out of that one muscle cell, but one muscle cell will not be enough to do much for us. So we're gonna have to bring in more muscle cells or muscle fibers. So we'll talk about the amount of tension within a muscle. So one of the things that we'll address is the number of muscle fibers that are stimulated. And we'll talk about something called motor unit recruitment. Another thing that can determine the amount of tension that you have within a muscle is the size of the muscle fibers. We'll address different muscle fiber types, type 1, type 2A, type 2B, and but also this is the only time we're really going to discuss it is hypertrophy, um, which can determine the size of muscle fibers. So muscle, um, the increase in size that someone gets from lifting weights is by hypertrophy. We don't, um, muscle cells, skeletal muscle cells do not divide. So the change that we get is actually due to the size of the cell. We're going to be adding more actin and myosin to that muscle fiber. So you can get hypertrophy. The more hypertrophy, that equates to more actin and myosin. More actin and myosin, we can generate more cross bridges. We can get some more muscle tension. So these are some of the things that can determine um, the amount of tension that we can get. Now the first one I want to address is the that amount of muscle tension in one muscle fiber. So there's something called the length ten tension relationship. And under normal circumstances, the way our bodies are designed is that we do have muscles in, in a relatively optimal length tension relationship where the Mat, um, we have a normal, uh, an optimized normal resting length that we can get the maximum um, tension developed out of that muscle fiber. Now what can happen though, so I want to show you some couple scenarios, is um, what would happen if you had increased resting um, muscle length or decreased. So on the picture, what you'll notice is the red right here those represent your actin and they're bound here to the Z disc. So here would be a sarcomere. And the blue represents myosin and those little ticks you see are the myosin heads. Now optimal length tension relationship, we have a good amount of overlap. So we have something to grab onto 
and then we can, when we start to slide, we can develop a pretty good um, amount of tension. Now notice that, say, over here, the far end of the right, is here we have stretched that muscle. There's an increased length. And what you notice at the far end is notice there is no overlap. So there's nothing to grab onto. You can't develop any tension. So tension zero. I can relate that to something that can happen in real life is that if anybody, if any of you have ever did any kind of weight training and if you were more into trying to see how much, how much you can lift, you're trying to increase the, the amount of, of uh, weight that you can lift is you, you, you will not, you should not stretch prior to lifting that weight. You want to warm up your muscles, but you don't want to stretch it because if you overstretch it, then what you're going to have is you're going to have less of that overlap and you're going to get less tension developed. Now over on the far left, far extreme, we have decreased length. Now right here, what you'll notice is that those, um, the actin is actually crossed over that M line and we have nowhere else to go. So you've got, you, you start here, there's nowhere to go because when the muscle fibers contract, the, the actin are sliding across the myosin towards that, that M line. So here, there's nowhere to go, so you don't have um, uh, tension developed. So, but usually we're somewhere in, over, somewhere in the middle. So if you've got too much rest, starting resting length, that doesn't give you an optimal length tension relationship and also if you have too um, short of a length to start with. So this is one thing that can affect the tension development within a muscle fiber. Now the more important thing is having to do with the frequency of stimulation. So we do have, um, with their individual muscle fibers, it does exhibit what we call an all or none response. So you have to have a minimum amount of, of um, stimulus strength to get that muscle fiber to be stimulated to contract and but what we'll show you is um, and it's the entire muscle fiber that one muscle cell every all the sarcomeres within that muscle fiber will contract now this doesn't apply to the entire muscle so here's just within an individual muscle fiber now we also, we're going to show you the relationship between the frequency, how frequently it's firing upon that muscle fiber and how they can relate to tension development. So on this picture here, these pictures, you start over here on the left. What you're seeing is you're looking at um, the green arrows represent when you've applied the stimulus uh, to that muscle and you're seeing how much tension that's being developed from that, from that um, muscle fiber. Is what they have done is you start here where it says wave summation, is they've applied the stimulus to the muscle, they applied it again before the muscle has finished completely relaxing. So you notice it comes up and it drops but doesn't go all the way down. So they've applied that stimulus again before the muscle is completely relaxed and what you'll notice is with each subsequent stimulation the tension is increasing out of that muscle fiber now if you look here in the middle where it says incomplete tetanus is they're now applying it it, it you know in greater frequency you see this wave summation so it's it's still kind of coming up and up and up now at some point you get the maximum tension developed out of that muscle fiber. But you'll do see again periods with incomplete tetanus where we have periods of relaxation. So you'll see that. But if you, you know, notice these lines are really close together here. Now you, you stimulate so frequently enough that you're going to get the maximum amount of tension that you can get out of one muscle fiber. And now you don't see any period of that muscle relaxing. And now we have a sustained contraction. And this is what we get typically out of our muscle fibers when the nervous system is stimulating it, is we reach what we call complete tetanus. And it has to come down to the frequency in which 
these these the motor neurons are stimulating that muscle fiber now the um the basis behind this it comes down to calcium concentrations in the sarcoplasm is what's happening is you've applying that stimulation and you're applying it again before there's enough time for the um, terminal cisterna of the sarcoplasmic reticulum to take back up all that calcium. And so we're stimulating, stimulate, stimulate so frequently that you have so much calcium now out in the sarcoplasm that we can get greater tension development out of that one muscle fiber. And if you stimulate it with it frequently enough, you'll get the maximum out of it and it'll be a sustained contraction and you won't see any period of where you see a little bit of that tension dropping because it's relaxing. So here, this is what we get from, this is what we always want out of skeletal muscle. And this is a skeletal muscle fiber. So this here is referred to as complete tetanus. Now this picture is kind of, it comes back to something I had mentioned before um, about a minimum uh, strength of stimulus that you need to be able to get muscle to contract. But here we're looking at getting tension development from a skeletal muscle. So not just one muscle fiber, but skeletal muscles, which are composed up of a large number of skeletal muscle fibers. So you'll notice here we had a certain voltage. I don't see any tension development. Here's another one. It, nothing. Here, that's a threshold stimulus that you needed to be able to get some muscle fibers to contract. And you'll notice that I got it. They said, and we'll talk about these um, motor units and stuff in a, in a moment. So I'm getting these kind of relatively small fibers to contract. I get a certain amount of tension. Now notice here, I'm doing an increased strength of my stimulus. And what I'm doing now is I'm going to now get more muscle fibers recruited. And so, because remember, one muscle fiber is really not going to do much for you. So I want, if I want to get more tension, I need to bring in more muscle fibers. I need to have a higher voltage, higher stimulus to recruit more muscle fibers and we're going to refer them as recruiting motor units to a certain amount. So you get to a, a certain stimulus, everything is already recruited, all the muscle fibers with that muscle are contracting. I'm going to get the maximum tension out of that skeletal muscle. So remember skeletal muscle is made up of uh, muscle fascicles and the muscle fascicles are made up of your muscle fibers. Now what is a motor unit? So here you have the section of your spinal cord. Here's your anterior gray horn of the spinal cord. Notice you'll see the cell bodies of those motor neurons located there. And what they've done is you, they've colored um, the uh, motor units three different colors. And what you'll notice is you have say the purple motor neuron it's coming out, you see the axon, and it's going to innervate some muscle fibers that have the same color. And they call this, in this case, motor unit three. And then you see motor unit one, motor unit two. What a motor unit is, is it's an alpha motor neuron in the muscle fibers that it innervates. And in a one entire skeletal muscle, you ha may have multiple types of mo or, um, numbers of motor unit ones. And then you'll have maybe multiple um, um, numbers of motor unit two, and then multiple numbers of motor unit three. What's what? What are the different motor units? Is the muscle fibers within one motor unit are the same type? So we'll talk about type one, type two A, type two B. They're different characteristic wise in regards to structure and kind of the tension that they can get out of that. Um, particular muscle fiber type. So what we're doing by increasing that strength of the voltage, the stimulus voltage, is we're going to recruit more motor units, you recruit more muscle fibers, you can get more tension. And we don't always have to recruit every motor unit out of one muscle. There's no need. If I'm holding a pencil, I don't need every muscle 
in my arm to be able to contract, to be able to hold a pencil. But if I want to list, lift 200 pounds, I'm probably going to recruit everything I can, probably still not going to lift it. Uh, but if I wanted to lift, say, 50 pounds, I could lift 50 pounds. But I'm going to probably recruit quite, quite a number of muscle fibers to be able to do that. Now here, this is actual a lab demonstration that was not done at, at Collin, but it was done at another university that I taught at. Is here, it was actual, so um, visually a student can see what would happen from motor unit recruitment. What was done is we have put um, electrodes across the muscles of the forearm and we're recording an electromyogram, that's an EMG. And they had a dynamometer which is a piece of equipment that can be used to measure force. And the subject was asked to squeeze the hand dynamometer to a certain level at each during each squeeze, like five kilograms, 10 kilograms, 15 kilograms, and slowly increase the strength in which they were squeezing that dynamometer to the point where they just couldn't squeeze any harder. And what you'll notice is, is with increasing amount of force that we see, say if this was five kilograms and that was 10 and we went up. Notice the amplitude of the electromyogram that steadily increased. And so what was being depicted is to get that increased tension development, you had to recruit more motor units. And that electrode was recording electrical activity of the muscles right underneath the surface because these were placed on the skin. And so more muscle activity, more motor units, you see that greater amplitude of the EMG. So this is a beautiful depiction of uh, motor unit recruitment. And actually this was, I actually did this um, experiment right here myself. Now the speaking again of motor unit recruitment, I had mentioned that each motor unit has a certain type of muscle fiber. So in one case, say motor unit one, they were all of uh, say the type one uh, muscle fibers. Motor unit two was all type of type um, 2A. So the muscle fiber types that we have in skeletal muscle, there's three types. Now they're gonna be classified different ways. They're gonna be classified the speed in which those mu the muscle contracts, and it comes down to um, the myosin ATPase activity, and also based on what is the major pathway which they produce ATP to be able to contract muscle. And so we have three types. Type one is also referred to as slow oxidative. Now the slow refers to is the rate in which myosin ATPase can break down ATP. It's slow. The oxidative refers to the energy generating pathway it uses to make ATP and it's using aerobic respiration which is oxidative um, it's a, and you can get a lot of energy um, from using aerobic respiration, so they call it oxidative. Now the type I'm going to jump to the type 2B that and that's just a typo here. That should say fast glycolytic is the fast glycolytic pathway. The fast twitch is referred to as the myosin ATPase um, breaks down ATP fairly quickly. The glycolytic refers to it uses glycolysis, which is anaerobic. That's the major pathway by which it produces ATP. Now type 2A is in between. It's called fast oxidative glycolytic. So it's somewhere in between the slow oxidative and the fast glycolytic. So I'm going to go through the these two and explain kind of the major um, characteristics of those type of muscle fibers. And, and not really do this one because it's somewhere in between. So I want to do the slow oxidative first. So notice the contraction speed is slow and it's related to that myosin ATPase. So the myosin heads have an enzyme that breaks down ATP. So remember myosin, the myosin head binds to ATP. ATP is hydrolyzed to inorganic phosphate and ADP. Remember that's going to be needed for that the um, the myosin had to be able to um, assume a configuration where it can bind to um, actin, and then when it releases ADP and inorganic phosphate, it can grab and pull 
on that actin filament. So you need the breakdown of ATP for the interaction, that sliding of actin and myosin. And the myosin ATPase, if it's slow, it's doing it slow. And so this is going to the contraction rate, or I should say contraction speed of this muscle fiber type is slow. Now, the this type of muscle um, fiber has is very aerobic. It has a high aerobic capacity because it's using oxidative phosphorylation to be able to generate ATP. Now, because it uses a lot of oxygen, it has stores a lot of oxygen and it stores it as, um, or the pigment that we have in muscle is called myoglobin. It's an oxygen binding pigment. So that's very high in this type of muscle fiber. And so, um, if you think about, say, chicken or any type of poultry, is the red meat versus the white meat. Well, chickens um, don't fly very much. So the breast meat is white and their legs are the, is the, um, uh, the, the dark meat. And what makes it dark is a lot of myoglobin. And the, the, um, so you have that with um, the slow oxidative is that is um, has a very high aerobic capacity. It's very resistant to fatigue. It's slow to fatigue because when you're using aerobic respiration to make ATP, you're not producing lactic acid, and so you can go a lot longer before you fatigue. Thing is, the, the muscle fiber types are small in diameter and they have low power. So the slow diameter, think about is if it's smaller in diameter, it's not going to have quite as much myosin and actin in there. It can't generate as much tension. So we'll relate this to, we'll talk about athletes, is if I'm um, going to talk about runners, the endurance athletes um, will have a lot more of this muscle fiber type in their legs. A sprinter won't. Because a sprinter is going to have more of this fiber type in their legs. Because they're going to be able to, what you'll notice is that this one has a much larger diameter. They can generate a lot more power. So, um, and notice it has a very fast contraction speed because the myosin ATPase is fast. So that, can, that muscles can contract very quickly, but because of their low aerobic capacity, they rely on glycolysis, so they have a more anaerobic capacity, they're going to fatigue much quicker. But the sprinters are going to get done with that race a lot faster than the marathon runners. So the, this, the um, sprinters, they we're talking, say, world-class sprinters, they have a larger percentage of the type 2B fibers in their legs the world-class marathon runners are going to have more of this in their legs. Now we are all have a, we don't have all of just one type in our arms or legs or anywhere. It's, it's a mixture of them. But genetically, you may have more of one fiber type versus the other. We can't change that. You're born with that. But what you can do based on if, how you train is you can make a particular uh, muscle fiber type work better. So if I want to train to run a marathon, I'm going to train a certain way and what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the capillarity of those muscles because I'll have increased blood flow to them to be able to de deliver more oxygen. The enzymes involved in the metabolic pathways that rely on oxidative phosphorylation, that's going to increase. And so I'm going to allow those fibers to work better. I will train differently if I want to be a sprinter, and there's no way I'm ever going to be a sprinter. I actually, believe it or not, was an endurance athlete, um, but it's been obviously a number of years since I've actually worked out. But um, um, one thing, though, you can do based on how you train is you can change, shift this type 2A to be more of a glycolytic type or more of an oxidative type. And it, it comes down to um, kind of changing the um, uh, chemical makeup 
or the enzymatic makeup of a muscle fiber type. Now the um, type 2B I had mentioned about you know the some of the characteristics is another one again based on the fact that it has very low aerobic capacity it doesn't have a lot of oxygen storage doesn't have a lot of myoglobin so that's that white meat so with the chicken so they have the white meat um, so these are different muscle fiber types and the thing is based on the amount of tension that you can get out of them and their their capacity of fatigue we can figure out what's the order in which we recruit these muscle fiber types so in that scenario where I was like I was trying to in, uh, squeeze the hand dynamometer um, you know try to exert five kilograms of force then 10 then 15 and then go up from there when I first started I didn't need these guys I just started off with some slow oxidative type they don't generate as much tension but they're not going to fatigue and I just don't need to, but I would say you don't need to bring in the big guns if you don't need to. Now, as I steadily want to increase the amount of tension that I want to exert, I'm going to recruit as many, all these that I have, and then I'll switch to these two. That's still not enough. Now I'm going to bring in the big guns. So the order in which you recruit the, mo the motor unit types is type 1 is first, type 2A is second, and then the type 2B. So, um... It's 1, 2A, and then 2B. Now the order in which muscle fatigues is the opposite. The first to fatigue is the type 2B, the second is the type 2A, and the last to fatigue is type 1. Okay, so I'm going to stop here and then we'll continue on in another recording.